Well, welcome to the Sportfish Spring Spectacular. And it's got a slight edge of winter to it still. Um, we're here at Diva Springs. Um, this is the first segment. We're going to look at some small still waters, the clear ones, and we're going to try and stalk a fish or two. Um, I always like to call it sight fishing because there's a real parallel between what we do on a water like this at Diva to what I might do on a river, um, say the Froome or, or the Itchin or something like that. It's a visual experience. And then we're going to meet, go on to Haywards Farm at the Sportfish Centre up at Reading, and then we're going to look at a slightly bigger water. But here we are, we've got catkins bursting out, we've got uh, just that little fresh bit of grass coming through, and all is set fair for a really lovely season ahead, we hope. We've got a bit of water, we've had a bit of snow, we've had a bit of everything. So we're looking forward to a really good year. Now, the gear. Um, I'm geared up. I've got a net. I've actually borrowed this net because mine were, apparently, according to Jonathan Tomlinson, was way too small. Um, so I've got a big net. Good idea. I've got a five weight, nine foot five weight rod. Um, that's got going to be my main modus operandi. It's going to be my main weapon to approach close quarter fishing. Um, I'm going to change when you get to the bigger water, but that's going to be the main one. Floating line and a minimum amount of stuff, but the most important thing for me, long build hat and then some amber glasses that will enable me to peel away any surface glare and polarise, literally, my eyes beneath the surface. And these, beyond all, all other areas, are probably the most important because I, in visual fishing, you need visual contact. And these give me optimum vision. So those are really important. Um, and flies too. Now, Jonathan, has clambered up to his loft and he's dusted down his stalking patterns for me and there they are. Um, they're way too neat to use because they're all in nice little neat areas. I go for a more chaotic approach, as everybody knows. So my flies are in there and oddly enough, not so chaotic as you might imagine. So I've tried to be neat and I've tried to be less chaotic. So this allows me to go it, and it was a lovely fly box made for me or a fly case um, by a friend of mine out in Denmark who's not going through the best of times at the moment, but I've got shrimps in here. I've got a funny fuzzy sort of, almost like a woolly worm like thing there. Um, white, great change color. Olive, it's our standard um, sort of pattern for a water like this. It doesn't cause any upset with the fish. It's got that allure. So that's their black, great early season pattern, all a little bit weighted. Um, and then we've got some stalking bugs here. So what can possibly go wrong? But to propel them, as I said, the five weight outfit, but the other important thing <coughs> is a leader. Now, Pete Cockwell and I have been talking about leaders that the most important thing you've got is the cast, the cast of the fish that you see. And the fish that you see, you're going to need to be accurate. And when you make that cast, the line will go out, it loads the rod, <coughs> excuse me. But once that tip's been engaged and that line turns over, you need that continuance down to the fly. A tapered leader is the way to go. Those flimsy bits of one section of straight nylon or fluorocarbon or whatever material you use is just going to hinge and waft around with the weight of the fly. So do invest in some tapered leaders and make them the big butt, not those sort of wafty little thin tapered things, but the big serious tapers that you've got with Rio and other, other brands. So we're all set, really. Um, I've got one other thing that I wouldn't take on catch and release is a priest. And if you're going to take a fish, do the dignified thing and take its life swiftly and celebrate it with a jolly nice glass of Chablis or Sancerre or some other delectation. 
but do the noble thing. If you're going to take a life, do it quickly. <laughs> 70 without glasses, it can only go, I mean, what can possibly go wrong? <laughs> Dyson, just imagine. Oh, that wasn't so good. <laughs> Don't film Oh, this is just sheer belligerence, really. Still, if I make that loop big enough. I do this because it's my test to myself that I can still do it. And if I end up having to wear glasses, it's almost like a little mini defeat in the day. Does that make sense? Uh, this is where I cut the lead. <laughs> After all that self-aggrandisement. There we go. And I've missed about three rings out. Yeah, there you go. Ah, one thing. When I get ready to go out, I always put my fly an arm width, or I suppose two arms widths, apart from one another and pop it on that ring there and bring that lead around the outside of the reel. But the important thing, I'm gonna, whip, oh, <laughs> I won't do that, I'll do that. The important thing is to bring it around that side of the reel not the other side of the reel, because if I see a fish, I want to be bringing it out from my left hand, not obviously across here, because then it will get all tangled from the get-go. So it goes around the left-hand side of the spool. There we go. Little tip. It might help. So slightly good to go with that one. We'll get the other rod in readiness for the bigger lake, because the smaller one um, only allows you to um, use a floating line this is an intermediate and another one the wind's coming into my direction and if i want to bring that leader towards me i just float it into my hand the amount the amount of times I've seen people go and do that and try and catch it. Well, it's going away from you, people. It's going to be difficult. All you've got to do is turn around and let that come into your hand. It's just so simple. There you go. Now, this is a very, very slow intermediate I've got on here. So... Um, I want a, a secret weapon for this one. I'm going into the orange secret weapon box. That's quite, you always know a good fly box. And I think I've mentioned this before. You see tufts of stuff coming out of the side of it. It's like going into your darkest secrets. And there they are, little beauties. So we might just happen to find a snake here and we might just happen to put that snake on just in case, you never know. In fact, I think the last time I used this was here. Let's take that bit of camouflage gunge off it there. No, I'm not going to chance luck twice. I'm going to put a pair of glasses in. So I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> now, 
the, th the other thing too is that um, snakes come in all shapes and sizes and you can get weighted ones and unweighted ones and ones with bead chain or rest of it. I, and to be honest, I just like unweighted flies for this. Um, and don't forget that if they do come with two hooks, just clip the bend off one of them and make it the one nearest the leader, not the one furthest away. Otherwise the whole idea is ruined. There we go. Because there's a lot of places that do not allow tandem hooks. So don't be naughty. There we go. And just trim that out and we're good to go. Again, same thing. Up there, hand widths apart or widths apart into that ring around the outside, the left hand side, wind. There we are, good to go. We've decided to sit it out, actually. We've got a spot here which you can see. And it's just a question of waiting for that moment to come through and, um, and taking that opportunity. Once that fish comes through, you throw a fly at it. I think probably what I won't do is stand in full vision of it though. I've always been slightly put off by having a spot there that's clearly for an angler. I'd much rather be here. Now, whether it makes any difference or not, I don't know. But it's just a feel more part of the landscape. Now, I'm making that plop sound because all of a sudden there was a bit of interest and it sort of died off. I think what we'll do is we're going to change this fly because it's been in front of a couple of fish um, and they're really not overly keen. So we're going to try something um, with a little bit more of a tail to it. I'm going to go, my, always my change colour is black, um, rightly or wrongly. It's normally a stark colour actually, but in this instance I'm going to change it to black. But there's definitely fish out here. Suddenly, there are a whole bunch of fish, but they're all brown trout. And they are, without doubt, the most capricious, difficult, cussed, obstinate, manic depressive of the trout world. Breathe. Oh, it's a lovely fish, actually. just sidled into view, the fly just danced in front of it and it nailed it and 
I suppose if anything, it's a glittering example of never, ever give up. But it's been a weird day. We've lost fish, we haven't really come anywhere near being as productive as perhaps we should be. And knowing how today's going, the hook will probably pull out. So I'm playing this really quite gently. But you notice the lines on the reel. Um, I'm a firm advocate, you invest a lot of money in a fly reel, you might as well use it, getting that head up over the rim of the net. Make sure the net's big enough and grip it by the area there, not by the handle. And there is our fish, boys and girls, and probably an extent of my derriere, but I don't care. So there you have it, persistence. It's a word that we use quite a lot because when it all goes wrong, and I've got to tell you, it was really difficult today for me. Um, the fish weren't in the margins, it was dark. Um, and chatting to Pete Cockle and gosh, no one knows stocking a water like this and this is his home. He said they just haven't been coming into the margins, but you know, that's, you can make every excuse you like, but at the end of the day, you just got to stick it out. And if you, you choose a style and you want to catch a fish that way, and I did today, um, then you've just got to tough it out. You know, that's all you've got to do. And ring changes. I mean, I don't normally change that many times my flies. So I changed about four or five times, which is about three times more than I usually do. Um, but this is the fruit of our labor. And it's not a double, but my goodness me, they'll tell you that these fish are finless wonders and all the rest of it. I've caught fish in the wild habitat in Colorado and Northern California. I have to tell you, they're not often in as good as Nick as this. I and mean, look at it, it's fin perfect. It's a beautiful fish. And it's what keeps me going. It's, it's what's kept me going for 50 years. So, well, more depressingly, but yeah, worth the wait, that, definitely worth the wait. What a beautiful fish. And I will get this smoked and I will enjoy it. And I see there's nothing wrong with that. And yes, I love putting fish back, but I also like eating them too. Having unceremoniously put my fly in that wonderful holly tree, I thought, well, let's change. But one tip, and it was Mr. Cockwill that actually gave me this tip, is if you want marabou to sink, wet it. That way, it doesn't float on the surface when it's cast out. So that's quite a good one, really. Um, so you've got a couple of tips. Now, this is quite a slow sinking pattern. Um, I've got an intermediate line. I've still um, got a five weight on. Um, I don't want to sacrifice that. And we'll just let that go down. And the lovely thing about this combination is it allows me to do a number of retrieves. So this is that very, very slow sinking line, almost a hover line. It's actually an original called a Kelly Green, which I've looked after and managed to keep hold of. It was our line of choice back in the day, but it's, it's now got so many um, different examples based on it. So you can get any amount of different types of line in this configuration. Keeping that loop really tight to cast into this breeze, it's not a huge win, but. A few pulls, get it all straight. Because very often you'll still get takes on the drop 
using this method. So keeping your eye on the line under the water and if it suddenly straightens out on you, that's a fish. Strange but true. So I always keep a slight angle, keeping my rod tip down it, but a slight angle to the line. And if it straightens out, more times than not, you will feel it. But if you can't, then chances are, and it straightens, it's a fish. So when I'm casting into a breeze with this light line, I haul late. I'm ever aware of that perishing tree and I do not want to send my line and my fly into it. Now this is where it does count, it does pay to count down. So I'm counting down to about 20, just searching the depths with a, this really slow sinking line. We're going to do a lot more of this in a moment or two when we go to Haywards Farm. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this. It's not what you come to this water to do necessarily. The whole essence of Diva is really about stalking your quarry, which we've done, and just having that visual excitement of the take as that fish comes up and opens its mouth and grabs that fly. And it is really the most exciting part of fly fishing. Just seeing that acceptance of that fish taking that fly. I mean, it's one facet, obviously, but it's why you would come here, perhaps. So I'm glad that we've done that for you. I'm glad that we've got that in the can, as it were. But it's still a nice way to spend a couple of hours just twiddling away. And I do tend to use a figure of eight retrieve I might just do a quick pull every now and again just to get a little bit of interest. The fly is terribly lightly weighted and still I'll hold it just in case a fish is following. But the secret when you do have fish following, let's get that out, there we are, is to keep the retrieve going. On these fish, it really does pay. If you've got a fish locked on, don't stop that retrieve, whatever you do. Um, unlike reservoirs, which seem to, uh, fish there seem to respond to that sudden stop, swirl, the hold, the classic hold, um, and the hang um, is just part of what we do. But in this game, doesn't seem to work quite as well. Don't know why. I couldn't possibly begin to tell you why. And what is it they say about ladies of a certain dimension singing? <laughs> Which I always thought was slightly unfair. Anyway, just changed the angle, went across the wind, counted down to about five, and figure of eighted and Bang! Fish. Sometimes it can be the simplest sport on earth. Sometimes it can be the most difficult. So there we are, two styles. And two very different flies. But both curiously black. So it does it really does pay to have color changes in your box so you can accommodate all situations. So in elegantly, gonna go and pull my waders up. I'll just bring that in a bit more. It. Head up, slide over that net, fish bash bosh. There we go, number two. So there we are, two fish, two different methods. Now it's into the car, over to Haywards Farm and the Sportfish Centre over at Reading. 
just a little bit up the 303, 334, M4, we're there for the next bit. So the day's not over yet.